The health unit says COVID-19 cases in Windsor-Essex still significantly high, but nearly half the adults in the region have their first COVID-19 shot. And just in time for Mother's Day, a podcast for new and soon to be mums, helping them navigate what delivery will be like during COVID-19 and beyond. Take a live look outside now, a ship making its way underneath the Ambassador Bridge. Those clouds starting to clear up. We'll figure out what's coming next in the forecast when Clark Kennedy joins us tonight. I'm Chris Hensing. Thanks for watching. The Catholic Church unveils a new system for reporting sexual abuse committed or covered up by a bishop. But victims of abuse are questioning that system. The CBC's Katerina Georgieva joins us now live. Katerina, what's the response been like to this move from the church? Well, Chris, the underlying message from both advocates and victims is that you should go to police before using this reporting system. And they're also raising an additional other red flags. But to start, let's talk through uh, how this system actually works. So it's funded by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, and it's Canada-wide. And you can either uh, call, uh, call by phone, or you can uh, fill out a form online. Now, this was created in response to a letter from the Pope that called for one easily accessible uh, reporting system specifically for bishops. So this is only for bishops. It does not, uh, it's not being used for allegations against priests um, because those allegations are still being handled at the local diocese level. But essentially with this reporting system, what happens is if a bishop needs to be investigated, they're investigated by a separate diocese. And then if the allegations are deemed credible, it goes all the way up to the Vatican. Now, Patrick McMahon, he lives in Windsor, and he was a victim of sexual abuse by a Catholic priest. And he says that there is some good in this move. There's more accountability, better documentation of these crimes, but he still has some concerns. Child abuse is a crime. Call the police. And I don't know why uh, they, they aren't a little more forthright in saying, Yes, please contact us uh, for religious healing and to help us root out these criminals in our midst. But we also strongly encourage you to go to the police. I also want to point out that this document only applies to bishops. Now, that's a good thing. Bishops have to be accountable too. But there are a lot more priests and religious and uh, lay people involved in the church than there are bishops. And a survivor's organization is also speaking out the survivor's network of those abused by priests. And they're also urging victims to go to police instead of using this portal. They say in part by creating yet another apparatus that keeps allegations internal, church officials are not disabusing the notion that what they care about most is the management of their reputations and finances. It makes more sense that all allegations are first routed to trained investigators in law enforcement and then sent to the church, not the other way around. And that was further stressed by a London lawyer and victim's advocate who says this is optics over substance. This is an institution that thrives on control and cover up. And the fact that they still want you to go to them rather than the secular authorities uh, demonstrates to me they still don't get it. Other organizations just simply point you to the police as is appropriate. These are crimes, crimes against children in most cases. The church's own language describes it as the worst crime. So why are we clicking on a link or calling a hotline to the church itself when oftentimes they're about as wrapped up in the problem as the perpetrator? Uh, Katerina, what's the church saying in response to some of these concerns? Well, Chris, the Diocese of London says that it takes all concerns, all of these allegations, very, very seriously. Now, when it comes to police, they say that police do get involved and will get involved on a case-by-case -case basis. They said that police are always involved in situations involving minors, and they stress that any victim can always involve police whenever they would like. The promise is that it's a transparent and accountable system. I don't know of an allegation that has not been taken seriously. Um, they will all be fully investigated, uh, whether it's through this process, if it's specific to a living or retired bishop, or if it's to the local diocese for, a, for past malfeasance on the part of a priest, deacon, or lay minister. 
Now, Clark adds that throughout this process, if you file a report, you get a case number and then you'll get updates. And then if the investigation is closed um, and, and there isn't, you know, further action being taken, you will get an explanation as to why. And just lastly, Chris, I want to mention uh, what the lawyer Rob Talek said to me earlier today. He wants everybody to remember that in Canada, there's no timeline for having to report a sexual crime, which means that you can go to the police at any stage in life. You could be late in life in your 80s or 90s and something happened to you as a child. You can still come forward. Police are able to deal with your complaint at any time. Chris. Thanks, Katerina. CBC's Katerina Rajiva, live tonight. MPs held an emergency debate last night on the possible shutdown of a key Canadian oil pipeline. The future of the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline has been thrown into question by Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who's called the project a ticking time bomb. Conservatives slammed those comments in the House yesterday. The statement that makes something very clear. It makes it very clear that this is, in fact, an emergency situation for this country of Canada. But it also makes it very clear that our government has failed to take appropriate action to ensure that this matter is taken care of. Sarnia Lanson MP Marilyn Gladu says there are several pipelines underneath the St. Clair River that are monitored like those in the Straits of Mackinac, adding Governor Whitmer's concerns are unfounded. Now Gladu says up to 23,000 jobs in her riding are directly or indirectly tied to Line 5. The pipeline carries petroleum east from western Canada and has run through Michigan for 65 years. It provides almost 50% of Ontario and Quebec's fuel supply. NEMAC and Unifor Local 200 will have to resume talks after a lengthy battle over a closed plant. A labor arbitrator has ruled NEMAC must negotiate a remedy over the closure of the Windsor aluminum plant. In 2019, the arbitrator dismissed the union's grievance. An Ontario court quashed that decision, and that matter was then referred back to the arbitrator, who issued another decision. They say it wasn't clear how the damages should be calculated, but would step in if there is no agreement. The president of the union says that this was the decision that they were hoping for. Roughly 270 people were employed at NEMAC when it closed three years ago. Windsor's unemployment rate jumped above 10% last month. It rose from 9.8% in March to 106 in April. The Canadian economy, they lost more than 200,000 jobs last month. Now, the biggest losses, they were felt by young workers in hard-hit sectors like retail and food services. A total of 207,000 jobs were lost in April. Most were full-time. Canada's unemployment rate rose from 7.5% to 8.1%. Further shutdowns triggered by COVID-19 are cited as the main cause. There's a walk-in vaccination clinic at a pharmacy in Windsor tomorrow. No appointments necessary, according to the health unit. Here's the details. It's for anyone 18 and older living in hotspots in Windsor, Essex. Anyone 50 plus living anywhere can go. Now this is tomorrow morning at Howard Medical starting at 9 in the morning. This is first doses only according to the health unit. The unit put out the number nearly half of ad all adults in Windsor, Essex having at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And when it comes to COVID-19 cases, a quick look here at one of those key indicators. It's trending in the right direction. Now, these are new cases over seven days per 100,000 people. The number's going down closer to where the health unit would like to be to consider lifting restrictions. The red control zone from the provincial framework is at 40. Right now, Windsor Essex sitting at 66. And while it is trending downward, Dr. Wajid Ahmed saying today, cases still significantly high. And a data issue may have led to a lower COVID-19 case count in Ontario today, about 3,100. But overall, numbers are heading in the right direction. As Ali Chieson tells us, even if the worst of wave three is behind us, health officials say avoiding a fourth wave is critical. Looking at the third wave's case counts, you can see the numbers trending downward. The rolling average in the last two weeks went from over 3,600 to just over 3,200. If you look at the number of new critical care admissions, the curve is starting to drop as well. It's still a huge number, but it, it really confirms to me that we've probably seen the worst day of, uh, of this third wave. The head of Ontario's Hospital Association says we are far from out of the woods. Our ICU occupancy is still at completely unacceptable levels. Make no mistake, the, the hospital system has only been able to deal with this challenge through superhuman efforts. Okay. I will say that the hospitals are full and uh, and busting at the seams. 
Take it from one of the ICU doctors we had to fly in from Newfoundland to help. Which is something that we're not used to in Newfoundland, and I think probably even here they're not used to. Dr. Allison Fury and her team is headed home this week after 10 days of punishing work in critical care in the city. What do our hospitals need right now, she says? A break. <laughs> um. Specifically, we need to avoid a fourth wave. And health officials say the vaccination rate alone is not enough to do that. Let's not make the same mistake that was made in the, in the second wave when public health measures were lifted far too prematurely. It's what absolutely accelerated the, uh, the, uh, the third wave and uh, it's what made it as, as punishing and uh, as serious as, as, it, as it continues to be. As of right now, the stay at home order is set to expire in two weeks. Regardless if it's extended or there's a partial reopening of sorts, getting vaccinated and following public health guidelines must continue. Critical care physician Callie Barrett says people should see more than just the COVID patients in the case counts. There are a quarter of a million patients, over a quarter of a million people in this province whose surgical procedures, many of them are incredibly consequential to their long-term health and, and quality of life that have been put on hold. And as long as our ICUs are as full as they are, those procedures cannot go forward. There are lives at stake. There is people's long-term quality of life at stake. We really cannot afford to mess this up again. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. As Mother's Day approaches, a new resource for new moms, a podcast for pregnant and postpartum women. It helps provide information women need, especially for those who are giving birth during the pandemic. Our reporter, Jen LaGrassa, has more. Hey, Mom. Hey, you. So here it is. Can you see that? You are listening to Tend and Be Friend. That's Deborah Herrick Kumusidis and her daughter starting off her new podcast. As a certified doula and pelvic floor massage therapist, she hears about the lack of support for pregnant women from her clients, but she also knows from her own personal journey to motherhood. I moved away from my um, from my family when I was a young girl. I have three sisters and three brothers, and most of them had already had kids by the time I left. And I moved here to Windsor and met my husband and got married. And I didn't have a, a community or you know any family support. I think had I had something like this to just listen to at that time, it would have been incredible. I would have changed the way I gave birth. And now with COVID, Deborah says it's even more essential that women get informed on what delivery might look like. I do really feel that women are not, not just asking, they're, they're demanding, they're begging, they're crying for extra. They're asking for clarity on mask wearing and COVID-19 testing results in the delivery room. These were challenges for Noor Hashim Fawaz, who gave birth three months ago. Deborah offered to be her doula, and the experience left Noor feeling so empowered that she pushed Deborah to start the podcast. I said to her, I really do feel a lot of the information you give me needs to be given to all women that are going through this. And it's such an emotional and vulnerable time for women. And I want you to gift people what you gifted me. And that's a voice, that's knowledge. Noor shares her full birthing story on the podcast, which has three episodes out so far. Deborah will release one episode a week and plans to talk about more women's issues. Hey, mom. Hey, you. Jennifer LaGrassa, CBC News, Windsor. There's a lot to be thankful for when it comes to our moms. And we wanted to know, what are the most important lessons you've been taught by your mother? Oh, she's always um, looking out for other people and always trying to help everyone. She's a teacher, so. <laughs> Honesty. Honesty and to be who you are versus trying to be somebody else. Always to stand up for myself and do as I please because I'm never going to please everyone, so I may as well please myself love life like every minute of life and it doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to get the most out of every single second but you know if it's good enough then learn to be happy with enough and it makes life a lot happier to just be good with enough. Like definitely my mom is a huge role model she's uh, she's always been she she's one of my role model in business she's always worked she had an incredible career she built her career up from the ground up and uh, I think that's where I get my, my drive and my perseverance from. To be kind to everybody. Compassionate. That she's very patient and loving and kind and can understand anything. I 
love her and she's she makes me happy a lot and yeah and she loves me a lot she gives me everything she i want i have to go back to the kindness like she's just the kindest person most loving person i've ever met um, my mother-in-law has to be her cooking best cooking in the world uh, i can attest that my wife unfortunately did not inherit that but uh, she's also a great mother to my fur babies so that's okay our two dogs a lot of love in there the Windsor Arena, a.k.a. the Barn, has seen some better days. Last month, the city denied Windsor Express a professional basketball team to revitalize the property. And now a group of Windsorites are sending around an online petition to save the over 90-year-old arena from being demolished. You know, it's not just about saving the barn only. It's about saving our downtown. And if the barn can be that focal point that will bring people down to an event, whether it's a sporting event, a concert, um, you know, you've heard that they were looking to have a volleyball league in there. It's probably going to keep people downtown. And they can then go venture out and, and try some restaurants, maybe go for a drink after a show or a sporting event. So really, it's about uh, revitalizing downtown. And that's what's starting to and that's starting with saving the barn. So far, almost 300 signatures are on the online petition. Another live look outside there as we see a bit of raindrops, I think, in the tower cam. A little bit of a weird afternoon here with the rain coming in and then the sun following behind. Collect Kennedy with a look at the weekend forecast after the break.
Canada is taking part in talks at the World Trade Organization about a temporary waiver that would lift the secrecy on patents for COVID-19 vaccines. Several countries have been calling for the waiver for months, and earlier this week, the U.S. said that it supports the idea. But Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was less definite about Canada's position. There are uh, different perspectives around the table from a number of different countries and uh, we need to work towards a consensus. That's the way the WTO works, but I can assure you that Canada is not uh, interfering or blocking. Canada is very much working to find a solution that works for everyone. Supporters say a temporary waiver would make it easier for developing countries to import the equipment, expertise and materials needed to make their own vaccines. He wowed you in the winter by traveling on a toboggan cookie now back, riding a skateboard. Look at all the fluffiness whizzing on by out for some fresh air in Jackson Park. Uh, his owner says he hasn't even scratched the surface of Cookie's athletic prowess. The seven-year-old rabbit just gets a little push and away he goes. Cookie sure knows how to enjoy the nice weather. We bring in Colette now. Take it like it doesn't even look real. Looks like a stuffed animal right there. Our, our friend <laughs> Cookie is just exploring some of the brightness that we have in Jackson. Oh my gosh, little nose. Like that's just, does it get better than that Colette? I don't think so. And I always worry <laughs> with things like that. Is the animal really happy or is it just like kind that's of true, stunned? Yeah. But there at the end, like it's just cleaning itself yeah. and, and could have, you know, hopped off, but didn't. So it must be comfortable <laughs> on the skateboard, more comfortable than I am anyway. Can't do that. Um, let me show you what's going on. I Can you believe the temperatures today? I mean, I can't really. We should be closer to about 18 degrees for a daytime high. It was 14 today. Didn't last long though, because then some of the rain thunderstorm activity passed through and that temperature dropped just after about three o'clock dropped. Uh, from 14 to 9, 5 degrees there, and now we're sitting at 8 degrees. Chatham can at 8 degrees as well with some of the activity we have here. There's quite a few lightning strikes, actually, and I'll, I'll put those, I'll overlay that in just a moment, but I wanted you to see kind of this cluster that is moving in, and also that as we get back a little further to the west, there's a few isolated cells back here. Uh, not likely those are going to continue to develop here as we're getting later into the day with some of the daytime heating, but a lot of convective activity likely again into tomorrow there with the lightning there so you can see so that's kind of what happens is it sort of dies off so there's just isolated showers in the overnight and winds down and then we get into some sun tomorrow and as we do in the afternoon that energy will just allow a few areas to see a thunderstorm or two pop up again not everyone is going to see the wet weather very important Mother's Day Sunday this system is really annoying me and I will tell you why I really want it to stay south it was looking like our earlier model runs today we're keeping it there we were just kind of on the nose but watch this as I play it forward yeah Lake St. Clair almost kind of the cutoff there as uh, it is now looking like we'll just get tagged here through southwestern Ontario with the cloud cover and uh, plan for some rain showers okay for now uh, maybe the next run will push this a bit further Further south, I'm going to be crossing my fingers for that one. Uh, tonight, a look at those temperatures for you then with the uh, isolated storms we'll be seeing. And same thing into tomorrow, about 14 degrees. Very similar to today in terms of where we're going to get to with that daytime heating. Through the period, until we get to about mid next week, we're going to see those temperatures running below seasonal and with the overnight lows as well. So Mother's Day, I know it's not about the weather, it's about mom. So no matter what happens with that rain. Uh, I hope everyone can enjoy it and a happy Mother's Day to all our mothers out there. No, absolutely. Thanks, Ms. Clad. Enjoy the weekend. You as well. A woman in Manitoba was able to get a little help from a stranger after a beloved piece of jewelry went missing. That's next.
A Manitoba woman giving thanks for the kindness of strangers. A beloved piece of jewelry went missing. She posted on Facebook about her lost pendant and hoped that someone may have found it. That's where we pick up the story. I'm a Métis, Anishinaabe and Scottish. So ravens are very important in both cultures. And this pendant has always felt like a really big connection for me to both my cultures. My sisters and I were actually around a fire pit in uh, my backyard because one of my other sisters had uh, passed away earlier this week and we were drumming for her. I went to hold the pendant while we were speaking and it wasn't there. I immediately started searching everywhere for it, making sure it didn't fall off in the grass. The only place I was that day was I went to pick up one of my sisters and I stopped at the liquor store to pick up a bottle of wine. So I posted, hey, if anybody finds this, I'd really appreciate the return and there'll be homemade baking in it for you. I was about halfway through my shift at work and I was taking one of my breaks and I was just uh, just perusing Facebook on my break and came across this post. I was at that at that location, of course, and I just thought, okay, well, I'm here. I guess I'll go look for this pendant. <laughs> I just stood in front of the store for a couple seconds and kind of scanned the ground um, in the parking, like around the parking lot. And I pretty much just spotted this like silvery thing on the ground right away. Or she posted basically she she found it, so I arranged to go get it from her. I could tell that she was just so grateful and I'm really happy that I was able to brighten up somebody's day. I feel well and truly blessed. It's a, yet another thing of, you know what, we got some really good people around us if we just look. Wow, beautiful reminder of what we can all do when we help out each other and what we can do when there's fresh baking, homemade involved. That's it for CBC Windsor News. Don't forget, for news anytime, you can go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. The Rick Mercer Report is coming up next. Thanks for watching. Have a good weekend.